So before we get into any more details about HTML, I wanted us to take a step back and get a big picture of what's going on, specifically related to the internet, the World Wide Web, what's a web browser, what's a web server, and also what is HTTP. And once we have a basic understanding of each of these, they will provide us with additional context to understand HTML. So the internet is just simply a network of interconnected networks. And whenever we talk about a network, we're just talking about a set of computers that are able to transmit and receive data between them. And you can have lots of different types of networks. So a university network, business network, government network, private networks. Uh, it really doesn't matter. What the internet is actually providing is a set of rules or protocols to be able to communicate between these different types of networks. And there's lots of services that can run on top of the internet. So these are what are called network services like email, file sharing, instant messaging, and also the World Wide Web. And in this particular course, the web is the most important, so let's talk a little bit more about it. So we now know that the web and the internet are not the same thing, even though we often use those terms interchangeably. And the web is actually just a network service that is making use of the internet infrastructure. And specifically, the web deals with the collection of HTML documents that are hosted on computers throughout the world. And it's this interconnectedness where we can link from one web document to another web document, so from one HTML document to another HTML document, for which the web gets its name. So now that we understand about the web and how it's a collection of these HTML documents, let's now take a look and see what happens whenever we request a web page. So on the left here, we have a computer system that's running some browser. And it could be any browser. It doesn't matter if it's Chrome or Firefox or Edge or Opera or Safari. They all work basically the same way. A browser is just simply a program designed to retrieve and present HTML documents. And on the right, we have a web server. And a web server is just a computer system that's designed specifically to host HTML documents and to be able to fulfill requests that may be coming in from things like a browser for one of those HTML documents. So let's look at an example where we do a request for the Google Search Engine web page, which is located at google.com. So the first thing that would happen is we would type in google.com into our address bar and press enter. At that point in time, a lookup is going to occur, which translates the google.com web address into the IP address for the server of where our document is located on the internet. So once we have this IP address, a request is sent out over the internet for that document located at a particular IP address. And once the server receives that particular request, it will see if it has the document that's been requested. And if it does have the document that's been requested, it will respond with that document and the associated assets back over the internet and then the web page will be rendered by the browser. Now, this whole entire request and response happens over a protocol that we call HTTP, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And don't be frightened by the term protocol. It just means a set of rules to accomplish some particular task. So now that we have a general idea of what goes on whenever we make a request for a web page, let's go over to Chrome and make use of Chrome's developer tools to see what happens in a little bit more detail whenever we make a request. Okay, so we have Google Chrome loaded up. Uh, if you need to pause the video in order to load up Google Chrome, go ahead and pause it and come back. All right, so to open developer tools on Windows or Linux, you'll use uh, Control-Shift-I or F12. And if you're on a Mac, you'll do Command-Option-I. So now you should have developer tools opened up at the bottom of your screen in a separate pane. And what these developer tools provide to us is a great way to inspect, debug, and test our web pages. And we'll be making use of developer tools throughout this course. So the first thing that we want to do now that we have developer tools open is turn off what we call caching. And in general, caching just simply means storing some data where we can quickly retrieve it at some point in the future. So this is usually what we want to have happen. And it does happen by default. So if we visit a website that we visited previously, uh, a lot of the files or the resources we'll be retrieving will be coming from local copies. There's a, a basically a comparison that goes on to see whether files have been modified or not. If they haven't been modified, they get loaded up from your computer, which is much faster than trying to load them up or download them again over the network. So caching generally is a good thing. So why are we turning it off now? 
Well, there are a few reasons why we may want to turn off caching whenever we're doing development. One is we may want to simulate the performance of the website as if we were a new user. So a new user to our website is not going to have a cache copy. Let's see how well it performs in terms of loading time whenever we have caching turned off. Another reason is to ensure that the resources that we're loading are actually coming from the server. So we want to make sure that all the things that we're wanting to load actually exist on the server. Any new files that we've updated are getting pushed out whatever it may be that they're coming from the server as opposed to a local copy because a local copy could be fooling us into thinking that something has been updated or that it looks correct when in fact it's not correct on the server. So with all that said, let's go ahead and turn off caching whenever we have developer tools open. So over here on the right side, you'll see that we have this gear icon and go ahead and click on the gear icon that takes us to the settings for developer tools. And over here on the far left side, you'll see that we have Disable Cache While Dev Tools is Open. So the cool thing about this is, is we can go ahead and check this, and whenever we have Developer Tools open, we'll have caching disabled. If we don't have Developer Tools open, then we'll have caching turned on, which is exactly what we want. So go ahead and check that, and then close out of the settings. So now that we have caching disabled, let's go over here to the Network tab, and click on it to bring up the network panel. And the network panel is designed for network performance evaluation. But for us, what we're going to do is make use of it to get more detail about what happens whenever we request a web page. So you can ignore the, uh, the information that we have right now on the panel. What we want to do is start fresh and we're going to go to w3.org. And whenever we do that, you can see that there's a lot of information being populated there in the network panel. And if you look at the bottom left, you see that we have a nice summary of what happened. We had 58 HTTP requests. We had 302 kilobytes transferred. So that's the number of kilobytes that were transferred to load this entire page. And it took 6.2 seconds. Uh, above that, we have a fairly detailed table. And this table provides the details of each resource request that was made. And it's been sorted by default by the start time of each network request. So let me go ahead and scroll up to the top here so we can get to the very first request that was made. And we can see that the first request was made to w3.org. Uh, before we go into any more specific details on that request, let me go ahead and uh, explain quickly the uh, column headings here in terms of what information is being provided. So the very first column is the name column, and that's just describing the name of the resource. Uh, the second column here is specifying the HTTP method that was used for the request. So anytime that we send out a request over HTTP, we got to specify what do we want to do with that resource. And in this case, we're just doing a get, which simply means to retrieve the resource at the specified location. The third column here is specifying the status code. So this is a HTTP status code. Uh, 200 means OK. It means that the resource was returned successfully. Uh, you may have visited a website before and received a 404 error. And that simply means that that resource was not found. If you're interested in learning more about HTTP status codes, just do a web search for uh, HTTP status codes and you can read more about those. And the fourth column here just specifies what type of resource. Uh, we can have an HTML document, CSS style sheet, some sort of image format like PNG, JavaScript. doesn't really matter. This is just simply specifying the type of resource. And the initiator column just specifies what initiated the HTTP request. You can see the first entry here uh, specifies other. And in Google Chrome, whenever it specifies other, that's indicating that the request came by clicking on a link. Or in our case, we just typed in the web address. Uh, all the other entries are coming from, I believe, the index. Well, some of them are not coming from the index.html. But most of them are coming from the index.html. So whenever we went to uh, this w3.org, the way the server's configured, the index.html is the resource that was found there, that particular document. And within that HTML document, there's links to other resources. Uh, one would be this minimum uh, style sheet file that's found on line 8. So these are line numbers specifying where that resource was found. So the interesting thing is this uh, document that's found at this particular location it has 
uh, resources associated with it, various assets that are specified in that document. And anytime we come across another resource, we have to initiate another HTTP request to get that resource. And if I was to click on this link here, it would take us to the index.html source page and show us or at least highlight the line associated with this resource. So if I click on it, you can see here on line eight that it's specifying that minimum style sheet here. So throughout this uh, index.html file, it is specifying various resources that require another HTTP request. So we go back over here to our network tab. You can see there's lots and lots and lots of requests being made because of resources being specified there in the index.html file. In the size column here, it just specifies the size of the resource that was sent across the network. Uh, the next column is the time column, and that just simply indicates how long it took to transfer the resource. And then the uh, last column here is the timeline column. And this gives us greater detail on how the time was spent in requesting and retrieving a particular resource. And if you hover over one of these colored bands here associated with a resource, you get a detailed breakdown on how time was spent. So you can see that uh, 0.088 milliseconds was spent on the request being sent. And uh, 262 milliseconds was spent on content download. So there's a lot of time spent here before you even start downloading that's just part of the request and part of just waiting time. And if you want to get a more detailed explanation, go ahead and click on this link here and it'll take you to another website on chrome.com that gives you a more detailed breakdown on what's going on. And actually this whole entire site relates to evaluating network performance. So this is just one section of a uh, fairly detailed page dealing with network performance. So if you're interested in knowing more information about what's going on with a network panel, then definitely check out this page. Okay, let's go back over here to the page that we were looking at originally, the w3.org web page. And you'll notice at the bottom here that the numbers have actually changed, and that's because I've reloaded this page off camera. But it actually brings up a few good points. Uh, one is that you shouldn't expect to have the same exact numbers, even if you were to load this page exactly at the same time I originally loaded it. Uh, but further, you'll probably be watching this several months after I've recorded it, and the page content may have changed in terms of the number of resources, what content's on there, how close you are to the server. So there's a lot of things that could be affecting those numbers. So originally we had 58 requests. Now it's listing 60 requests. Uh, now it has 302 kilobytes transferred, and it took only about half the time to load this page. So 3.06 or 3.01 seconds as opposed to six seconds originally. So there's one more feature that I wanted to show you before we wrap up our discussion of the network panel, and that's the ability to filter our requests by type. So if you go to the top here, you can see that we have several different types listed here. And if we click on any of those, like images, our requests are now filtered by just those types. So none of the things related to style sheets or documents are gonna be listed now. And it also updates the summary at the bottom. So you can see that we now have 40 requests uh, out of 60 total that were related to images. So not only did the images represent the majority of the requests, they also represented the largest percent in terms of the kilobytes transferred. So 214 kilobytes out of 302 kilobytes were related to the images. And this is probably typical of most websites. So if you have images or sound or video files, then those will take up uh, generally the largest percentage in terms of your content size in comparison to the text on the website. So we've looked at some of the details related to the network panel. But the big thing that I want you to take away from this is that websites can consist of a lot of different assets, HTML files, CSS files, images, script files, etc. And each of these files has to be transferred from the server to your browser by HTTP. And having an understanding of this when developing a website will help you understand how to better optimize the site. And in fact, later in the course, we'll come back and look at various optimization techniques that we can use to improve the performance of our website.